Yes, so um, a big milestone for the DSSC to be able to uh, present uh, version 1.0 of the uh, blueprint. As Boris already mentioned, the result of a collaborative process between all kinds of organizations that uh, develop solutions for blueprints, for uh, data spaces, or that develop data spaces them, themselves. And there is a clear need uh, to, uh, to have it. Um, and, and we identified actually three key reasons. First of all, to get to a higher flight level more quickly. There are a lot of things you have to think about when setting up a data space. Uh, and if everybody needs to reinvent the wheel again, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and if we really want to have this European data economy flying, then we need to um, uh, yeah, get going much more, much more quickly. And the blueprint enables you uh, to do that. Second reason is to be able to protect investments. Um, many, especially uh, enabling companies that want to develop uh, things like connectors and software or consultancy, uh, for data spaces, they want to be able to do it across multiple domains. Um, and if you're investing in it, uh, you always want to make sure that your investment is also future proof, that you choose the right standards um, uh, so that it not only works today, but it is also working tomorrow. So protection of investment and making things future proof. And thirdly, uh, the role of federations, organizations typically want to join multiple data space uh, initiatives because you're not only active in one sector, like say manufacturing, uh, but you also have uh, to deal with uh, uh, the Green Deal and with energy so you, or with mobility. So <clears throat> as a single company, you want to be able to join multiple data spaces, maybe in different sectors or in different regions because you're um, working internationally. Um, and then it becomes quite important to also achieve synergies between data spaces so that they can learn from each other and, and make it easy to, uh, to set up, but also to allow participants to easily join multiple data spaces. So faster, future proofing federations. And in order to get there, the blueprint is a crucially important uh, element. Now, the blueprint itself is not new. Um, it builds on the knowledge that is generated in this uh, domain in the past uh, few years, although it, it got a lot of traction, in, let's say, in the last one, two years. Uh, there were already some pioneers working on this uh, for several uh, years. We've seen many data space initiatives uh, that already adopted uh, the results from the OpenDI project that uh, I think uh, about four years ago, um, published uh, this uh, document, the Design Principles for Data Spaces, and there for the first time a set of building blocks was identified in uh, three technical pillars uh, and in one uh, governance uh, pillar. And that laid the foundation for our work because you can still trace a number of things that we published today in Blueprint version 1.0 back to uh, that development. So when we started uh, in uh, uh, end of 2022, beginning of 2023, uh, the Data Space Support Center, we've launched uh, the starter kit and we took that uh, uh, OpenDI result as an input uh, for that. And later last year, we published the initial draft version of the blueprint version 0.5. And one of the things that changed uh, between OpenDI and the blueprint that we presented then and that we present today is that, as Boris rightfully said, we put way more emphasis on the organizational and business side of things. Um, in, in OpenDI, it was, let's say, just the fourth column. Now it is really an integral part of, of our blueprint. Uh, and today we are launching version 1.0 uh, of this blueprint. Now the blueprint itself, uh, it consists of uh, two parts. Uh, it consists of, first of all, of building blocks, and they are categorized in business and organizational and technical building blocks. Now, on both sides, each building block identifies required capabilities for a data space. It doesn't specify yet how you should do it, but it is typically something that every data space needs and needs to think about. And then secondly, it introduces some core design decisions, not design decisions that we take, but design decisions that every data space initiative should take for each of those building blocks. But in order to get to that higher flight level, for many building blocks, we're able to provide common specifications and common standards or best practices so that you can really get to that higher flight level much more quickly. 
And finally, for each of the building blocks, we provide links to a lot of further reading material to we've identified best practices in our community of practice, and we have shared that in uh, the building block specifications. So with that, uh, maybe Claire, you want to take over for the business and organizational building yes. blocks. I think you have to Thank scroll you. with the wheel. Yeah, I will do that. Oh. Um, yes, I will explain you a bit more on um, the business uh, governance and legal building blocks. We have three pillars here. And if we compare that, for instance, to our previous blueprint version, um, we can actually say that we did not add new building blocks. We only changed some names for the governance building blocks. And for the rest, we extended the material inside the building blocks. I will um, dive a bit deeper into that together with you. So to start, for instance, with the four business building blocks, um, where we have a clear focus on uh, the value creation, especially with the business model, the value creation for, uh, first of all, the data space itself, but also the value creation for the participants, because that needs, of course, to be aligned with also the focus of um, the value creation of the data space. And we provided uh, a guidelines, templates, uh, further reading on the customer journey, on revenue and cost models that are very important for this. But we, for instance, also focus on uh, use case development. And um, an example of a use case is, for instance, in uh, for the uh, mobility data space in, uh, for instance, uh, the built environment, uh, when monitoring the mobility infrastructure by collecting data about that, that could be an example of a use case here. And this building block is in particularly uh, supporting in exploring, developing, and also onboarding such use cases. Um, another building block that we have are uh, the data products that are already mentioned uh, by Bert, this specific specific building block is focusing on the development of such um, a data product, for instance, a data set could be an example. And there are also templates to create this, um, as well as insights on governance and rules and principles to come to good data quality and security. Uh, this is an optional building block, so not every data space uh, will have this, that, and that's the same also for the data spaces uh, intermediary. That's an optional participant that provides enabling services for a data space, and um, when referring to enabling services, you can, for instance, think of identity management. Um, in this building block are four types of generic uh, models explained how a data space intermediary could look like, and various guidelines are provided. Uh, this all brings us to uh, an overview of the various uh, value creation approaches related to the business model. So it's also uh, explained how these building blocks uh, contribute to the business model and relate to each other. Now I would like to move to the uh, governance. Oh, go back and see. Yeah, to the governance building blocks. These are the governance building blocks where we uh, focus on um, organizational uh, form and governance authority. Um, and there it's important to realize that it's uh, dependent on the type of organizational form you choose that, that also impacts your further governance and also how your governance authority is organized. So uh, to give an example, if you, for instance, decide to uh, make it a non-for-profit organization, then you need also a general assembly and a management board. Um, besides that, uh, we have the building block of participation management, where it's focused on um, the, the governance of the participation, so to onboard and offboard the participants, uh, and their clear criteria uh, are provided for the admission and also for continued uh, participation, but also for the specification uh, of the roles. Uh, for that, a decision tree is uh, provided to support in the decision making uh, on these topics. Um, and we also have uh, the legal building blocks here. Um, so first of all, we have uh, the regulatory um, compliance, that's very important, and the contractual framework. Um, and for regulatory compliance, it's really to ensure uh, to adhere to the law. Um, and therefore, an overview of uh, the EU legislation is provided and also the roles and responsibilities uh, that relate to that. 
On contractual frameworks, um, the focus is on two parts. So on data space uh, agreements, uh, on the agreements among, among the participants, but also on agreements uh, on the data transactions. And also for this, uh, there is a tree provided here. You can see some examples of uh, relevant uh, legislation um, that uh, a data space and its participants need to take into account when uh, setting up a data space and working with it. Um, what's new to um, uh, these green building blocks? I would like to uh, summarize that uh, for you. Um, first of all, um, for the business side, uh, there is a visual overview of the business ingredients that are needed. Guidelines and templates are provided to take uh, business decisions and make it more practical and easy uh, to work on this. Um, and then for a governance, as I mentioned before, uh, we renamed two building blocks from uh, organizational governance into organizational form and governance authority to really um, make the focus more clear. Uh, and the data sharing governance uh, is now called participation management. Uh, as mentioned, there is a decision tree uh, provided uh, to organize and establish the data space and uh, guidelines on on and offboarding for participants. And uh, for the legal side, we um, have a checklist to become regulatory compliant and contractual framework agreements uh, to support in making agreements among participants and uh, on data transactions. That means that um, also with this version, we provided actually more details, more practical guidelines, and the idea is to further detail and, and make it more practical also towards the future. And now I would like to give uh, the floor to Mathijs. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Claire. Um, yeah, so moving on to the technical side of, uh, of things. So as you've seen on the business and organizational side, we, we clearly have way more building blocks than we had a couple of years ago. Uh, on the OpenDI side. If you compare that to the, uh, the technical building blocks, you will see lots of similarities. So you still see the three key pillars, one on data interoperability, one on data sovereignty and trust, and one on data value creation enablers. So the interoperability pillar, we start off with uh, that one, that's really about the common data models that you need in a data space. Uh, so semantics, um, you need to agree on that. And that's, in many cases, domain-specific, hence not covered as such in the, uh, the DSC blueprint. But we do try to provide you with ideas and guidelines as to how to set this up. How do you manage your data models in your community? And how do you also use them to configure the technical APIs that are needed to exchange data? Importantly, also, there is the notion of provenance and traceability. Because in many cases, there's a one-on-one -on -one translation from all the legal constructs that you have and technical requirements, for instance, to set up a notarization service in your data space for future traceability and so on. And that's also part of this pillar. The second pillar on data sovereignty and trust relates to um, the core, core notion of how to establish trust in a data space. And if you want to establish this, you need to know the other organization that you're dealing with. And typically that's not, that's an unknown organization because there is not a single system in a data space. And somebody comes to you and uh, wants to have access to your data or there's another business uh, scenario. So how do you then know, first of all, who this organization is and whether or not that organization actually complies with the rules and regulations of your data space? So that immediately links to the first two building blocks here. Identity and attestation management, the identity, as the name says, but also other attestations. For instance, I'm complying with certain legislation or certain security frameworks, or I'm a member of a data space. Secondly, there's the trust framework, because you always need one organization or multiple organizations that um, uh, can provide trust uh, in this data space, that can actually verify that indeed you are a member of, uh, of a data space. And finally, there's the notion of access and usage uh, policies. So uh, as a data provider, you want to specify under which conditions your data can be accessed, by whom. Uh, and there's a policy. And if on a technical level, somebody wants to 
uh, access that data, that policy needs to be checked and it also needs to be enforced. So that's all part of this second pillar on data sovereignty and trust. And finally, there's the data value creation enablers, uh, because of course, it's not just about the technical interoperability and not just about uh, the semantics. We also need to do something with that, with that data. And in many cases, that is a function that needs to happen within an individual participant of a data space. So it's not governed by what we do over here. But there are certain key functionalities that need to be supported there. So, for instance, you need to be able to specify what kind of data, what kind of services, and what kind of offerings uh, you have in the data space. Uh, and by the way, this is a technical notion. Uh, there are other scenarios possible as well. It's not just about trading data, of course, but in any case, you need to be able to publish not only who you are, but also what you have in, in the data space. Um, that needs to be discoverable. So maybe you need to have a catalog of that uh, information. Uh, so you, it's also becomes findable. findable. And finally, there can be all kinds of value added services, for instance, provided uh, through this data, a data space intermediary that we talked about uh, before. Um, a service that provides uh, event brokerage uh, in a data space or supply chain resiliency services. Uh, common services that, that made, are made available in a data space. And that's under the value-added services bit. So now that you have an overview of the, of the building blocks, let's uh, dive a bit deeper into this. Um, the, the technical side of building of data spaces is maturing. We see a lot of technological convergence uh, here. And for us, very importantly, are the four foundational standards that are mentioned here in this slide. So it's on, it's on DIT for decentralized identifiers, because there are a lot of things that need to be identified. You can think of persons, you can think of assets, you can think of all kinds of things that play a role in that, in that data space, and you need to be able to identify them. Then there is this notion of uh, trust and attestations. And for that, we have the W3C standard for uh, verifiable credentials and verifiable pre presentations. And that plays a crucially important role for the distributed credential validation so that you can actually validate in a distributed way this organization has this identity and is part of this data space it is a foundational standard for setting up your trust framework and below that you can see i already talked about it on access and usage policies and also for that there is a foundational standard odrl to be able to specify this and to the left, there's the DCAT standard, which is very well known in the uh, open data uh, field. And we also can deploy it in the data space world uh, to specify data services and offerings and to set up catalogs uh, of those. So these are important foundational standards uh, that we promote as a data space support center. Now, of course, that's not enough um, uh, because more is needed. How do these standards work uh, together? Um, and we try to specify that in, in the building blocks, but also we try to avoid reinventing the wheel there. Uh, the Data Space Support Center consists of uh, many organizations active in deploying those kinds of standards, um, providing standards frameworks how to, how to use them. Uh, we also have the wider uh, community of practice where a lot of organizations are working on uh, this. So what you will find in the blueprint is not only the notion of those foundational standards, but also how they can work uh, together. And for that description, we rely on the work of many of the organizations involved. So to mention one thing here in particular, that is the data space uh, protocol um, that really describes how uh, for instance, these verifiable credentials, ODRL and DCAT can actually work together if two participants in the data space want to share data. So it's an important standard for us and we refer to it uh, in uh, uh, the, the building blocks and we also recommend its use uh, by data space initiatives. Still, and that's the top level that you can see here in this picture, there are other agreements that you need to make because they are data space specific. So also on the technical side that there are certain design decisions that you have to uh, uh, take yourself. Uh, I already mentioned, for instance, the, the example of uh, semantics that is domain specific. So in your data space specific rule book or blueprint or agreement or whatever term 
uh, you define there. By the way, I'm looking at you here, Bert, for the glossary. Maybe we need to find a specific term uh, for uh, for this. Um, but anyhow, there will be data space specific uh, elements. But because we have this common basis, we allow you to focus on those things and at the same time also facilitate interoperability between data spaces. So also to give a little overview on what is new in version 1.0 compared to uh, the draft version that we released early on, we have more emphasis now in the first pillar on the use of a vocabulary hub to uh, manage uh, semantic models in your community uh, process. Uh, and we, for the first time, introduced some, some approaches for provenance and traceability. It was rather empty in version 0.5. We've now uh, provided some more content uh, here, and we hope to add further content in next versions of the Blueprint. I already talked about what we did in uh, the, the second pillar, so the use of verifiable credentials, the role of trust frameworks, and uh, access and usage uh, policies. Um, and finally, in uh, the third pillar, uh, we explained the use of DCAT. Um, and, and I think that's actually an important change to highlight. Uh, if you looked at previous versions of uh, our blueprint, and also uh, if you looked at uh, the OpenDI framework on data value creation, it was just about the marketplace. And we said, well, that is a business model, and, and therefore that could be a technical service that you need. But similarly, if you have a different business model that is not based on the actual trading of data, uh, but just the use of data, then probably you don't need a marketplace, but you need other kinds of value-added services. So that's why we've replaced the marketplace building block with a building block titled value-added services, and the marketplace is only one of the possible value-added services as we see. Now, of course, um, I've talked a lot about uh, standards and specifications, uh, but at the end of the day, you also need to implement uh, things. And then a building block does not translate one-on-one -on -one into a software component. So in version 1.0, we have created a functional overview of software components, now for the first time. Um, and there we distinguish between software that you need uh, on a participant level, so in some instances, this is called a connector, but there's some other approaches maybe as well. But on a participant level, call it here a participant agent, you need to have a piece of software uh, that implements essentially two things. Your control plane that handles all the things uh, around verifiable credentials, your access and usage policies, the, public, the publishing of your data uh, sources. So that's the whole control plane uh, part. And on the other hand, uh, also the data plane. So this is where the actual data exchange take place. And those two, they need to work hand in hand because you only want the data exchange to take place if uh, certain checks uh, have, been, have been made. And this is all in the uh, participant agent. Then on the other hand, uh, you can see some shared services. So your data space probably needs to have some sort of participants registry. Uh, probably you need some sort of catalog where you can find all the data entries that are available in the data space. There's the vocabulary hub. Maybe you need the notarization service or the other value added services that we talked about. So that also constitutes a category of software components. So this is a list. If you go to the blueprint, you will also find a picture of this. And we hope to be able to work with the community uh, to also identify key examples of those um, uh, categories of components. Um, and we do that with the, the parties in the data space support center, the wider community. Uh, and this is also something where we seek alignment with uh, the simple initiative that aims to build a distribution of uh, open source software components also for data spaces. Now with that, I can even fill the full uh, one and a half hour with all of this. Uh, I can also imagine that it is now difficult for you to grasp, uh, okay, but where, where should I start? Which building block? There are nine technical building blocks, even more business and organizational building blocks. So maybe uh, this is uh, something, uh, Claire, where you can uh, yeah. take us through how to exactly. navigate uh, the blueprint. Exactly. And uh, compare it also a bit with when building a house. Um, well, we explained today all the ingredients, the various building blocks, but how to bring them together and where where exactly to start. Um, 
So first of all, um, well, the, exactly what I said, where to begin. And um, it's often also a collaborative process. So you really need to do this together with the participants in the data space. Um, and not every building block is also needed at uh, the same time. Um, and thereby important to build on the results that we have here. Um, so we developed the co-creation uh, method. And the co-creation method is really an, an approach to guide the data space initiatives on uh, where to start, how to set up a data space, and also um, yeah, how to run it when it's operational. Um, and therefore, along the various uh, steps of the, the data space uh, life cycle, so to say, from the exploratory stage through the operations, um, various processes have been developed. So to align the stakeholders in this collaborative process on the scope of the data space, uh, to develop the use cases, as mentioned before, and uh, focus on the functional requirements there, but also how to organize this in an organizational way, which organizational form to choose. Um, and next to that, what are the functional uh, elements that are needed uh, to design uh, the data space and how to establish the agreements and uh, yeah, become legally compliant. Uh, based on those processes, we linked the various uh, building blocks uh, to them. So both business and organizational ones, as well as the technical ones, to really support here in, in guiding where to start and when which steps to be taken. Um, in the next uh, figure, uh, in the previous figure, you saw the, the blue and the, the green building blocks. Here you see really a listing of these building blocks uh, exactly for each of the processes that I was uh, just mentioning. Um, so it starts with the stakeholders, then later on move from the from the business and organizational side to the technical side. Later in updates, you will see that some um, building blocks uh, on the technical side might also start uh, earlier, but that's uh, for the future. Um, but this is all to really support in uh, yeah prioritizing and, and really going and navigate uh, together towards uh, the data space and becoming operational. Um, well, this is so far our uh, presentation on the blueprint and the co-creation uh, method. Um, if you want to connect, use and contribute uh, to this work, um, you can use the blueprint that's presented uh, online uh, and thereby um, enhance and develop your rulebook for your own data space um, you can comply or comply or explain, you can contribute. Um, and as mentioned in the beginning, um, we provided uh, there the various details, and you can also find it here of our website uh, to come in contact. Uh, yeah, people with. cannot only do that, people should do it. And we, we sure. truly welcome uh, exactly. your input on this, yeah. uh, both your experiences, how you can use it, but also if you have uh, further additions and suggestions uh, for the various building blocks that we uh, that we have. Exactly, because it's important to uh, co-create this uh, together.